However, the costs associated with establishing the outdoor emergency shelter, about $500,000 to the November budget process. We have Council Member Harrison here. Council Member Harrison, I see you have settled in very well to that, that seat. But I'm wondering if you might come join us here oh, sure. or here perhaps so that, because uh, I think you're going to be presenting a lot. Okay. Um, and I want folks to be able to hear. I want everyone to be able to hear from you. Thank you. That was very really thoughtful of you. I appreciate it. We've got space, so great. All right, she's not on the committee, but she is here to uh, present her item. Um, thank you for the, the time and for getting us on the agenda so quickly. Thank you very much. Um, as Councilmember Hahn mentioned, this is actually a set of five referrals that help deal with problems affecting people that are living on our streets today. One is stable shelter, and that referral looks at providing better tents to people. Uh, another is issues of access to social services and to uh, a set of behavioral rules and security that will make the location more uh, manageable. Uh, other issues addressed in these five referrals are sanitation and disease prevention through installation of affordable toilets, hand washing stations, and mobile showers. And finally, just general cleanliness through garbage pickup. Um, this is not intended as a long-term solution. It's a recognition that there are people on the streets right now who need shelter, sanitation, cleanliness, and social services. Within the next year, we of course want to get people into permanent housing. But within the next month, we want to prevent people from dying of exposure. We know this model works. The Modesto Outdoor Emergency Shelter is exemplary, and Governor Newsom recently held a homeless center in Modesto so that other jurisdictions can learn from them. Oakland has pioneered safe parking and tough sheds, both of which are effective at getting people indoors and out of the cold and rain, however temporarily. In our own backyard, we resisted for years the here, there encampment when it was loosely organized. Now it has a set of expected behavioral rules, regular garbage pickup from the city and sanitation services, and residents of here, there, and the surrounding neighbors generally have an amicable relationship because we've stabilized the situation with the help of the residents of the encampment. This does not just benefit the unhoused. Every single resident of Berkeley benefits when people are able to dispose of their trash and bodily functions in a clean, systemized way. Two years ago in San Diego, there was a hepatitis A outbreak that began in a homeless encampment and spread throughout the county. This is what happens when people are not provided with the resources they need. It is in the interest of Berkeley's public health to provide hand washing stations, trash pickup, showers, and toilets to everyone, not just those with physical address. <coughs> to date, we have more than doubled the number of shelter beds available to unhoused through efforts to create pathways through adoption of the uh, emergency winter shelter in Old City Hall during the winter rainy months, through um, adding beds to veterans, the veterans building, and we we're adding another 59 beds at Berkeley Way. So we will have seen, with all of that, more than a 50% increase in the number of shelter beds available. But it is simply not enough. And I think it's wishful thinking to think that we are going to suddenly build enough housing or suddenly even provide temporary indoor shelter for people in a timely manner. Um, the item does make some suggestions about location, and I'm going to talk about that in a second, although we defer to staff's judgment. Uh, there is some space at the southern end of the Pathway Stair Center, where we also know that people are interested in the third module there. Uh, and um, there's also, finally, a lot under University and 2nd Street that is city-owned should have room for up to 100 tents and is currently underutilized. I'm going to um, hand the committee members pictures of this lot. This is the city lot as it exists today. And I'm going to give this to you in a second. As you can see here, this is under the freeway off University. This lot, oh, I'm upside down, sorry, is being used, <laughs> to, <laughs> to, say, yeah, <laughs> is being used to store pipes and other city materials. It's a fenced in city lot that is not serving people but things at the moment. Um, this gives you a map, a physical address idea of where this is. It's a kind of a hard place to find. There are right now 10 to 15 people sleeping at the side of this parking lot, including Mama Bear and some other people that are disabled, seniors, etc., cetera, um, in a place that is not disturbing anyone. This extension of university is essentially dirt next to this parking lot. So that's one of the places we're suggesting. And finally, 
here is a picture of the kind of tents they were able to put up in Modesto uh, that are, they have steel sides, they have ventilation with a nice ventilation flap and they're a little bit sturdy, a lot sturdier than what is available to people when they have to provide their own, their own tents. Um, we are including this potential location because we want this to succeed and we want it to succeed now. Um, I am really proud of the work that we've done in Berkeley to house people and to provide uh, shelter, temporary and permanent, but we're too slow as a city. We're just too slow. And I don't want to face another winter of this. We need to set up an emergency outdoor shelter now. According to the most recent point in time count, there are over 800 people living outdoors as we speak. About 500 of them are in tents or simply lying on the sidewalk. The other 300 are in RVs, cars, abandoned buildings. Um, we know that this is, for me, this is a moral outrage and I want us to find or build permanent housing for all these people, but that process could take simply years. We need a way you can get people shelter and sanitation immediately. Let's follow Modesto's lead and get people off the streets now. I also want to say this is consistent with the work of the Prop P Committee, which has established a number of guidelines for funding for homeless services out of Prop P, including an allocation for temporary shelter, in which they included the idea of an emergency outdoor shelter as one of the possibilities. So they've envisioned doing this, and I think they're looking at about 35% of the approximately 6.5 million we're likely to gather each year for that purpose. So we have funds that we could allocate. The item calls for an allocation of about $500,000, of which a, a lion's share is for the toilets and um, shower program, the hand washing stations rather. There's also allocations for purchasing these tents I should say, however, in Modesto, the tents were donated by a group to me, I'm not finding right now, uh, Q Quamp, Q-A-M-P, donated these tents. It's a Reno-based company, um, but we think if we had to, we could buy these for about $10,000. Uh, portable toilets can be rented for about $78 a month, which includes the weekly cleanings and hand washing stations for $93 a month. Um, and cleaning, doing trash pickup is an essential service that we need to provide, regardless of what happens with this item. Hearing what's happening with the Caltrans parcel is simply heartbreaking. People are collecting this trash, they're trying to be good citizens, they're putting it in bags, bags get ripped apart, and before they even get ripped apart, Caltrans just doesn't take them. So we need regular trash service. So we're looking at renting dumpsters in the short term and for a major cleanup and then ongoing uh, large large trash cans. So all told, the cost estimate here is about $500,000 a year for this, for this location or this kind of service, which we believe we could house about 75 people. Um, I want to say also, this is an important bit of background that's been kind of in, in, the, in the mix, but has been ignored. Uh, we, uh, Council Member Hahn and I, nearly 18 months ago sent a um, referral to the Homeless Commission asking if they look at emergency outdoor shelters that would be organized and we asked them to consider things such as location, who the residents might be, how many residents, the duration of stay, whether there be rules and codes, codes of conduct, how the camp would be governed, um, the removal and exclusion of individuals, if that's important, um, engagement with services, what the facilities might look like, any First Amendment issues, and what agency in the city would be responsible. Um, we've had a frustrating time, frankly, not with Mrs. <laughs> Ms. Maraz, this is Ms. She's name I always get lost, but thank you. Carol. Um, Ms. Carol. <laughs> Ms. Carol, I'm gonna just go for that. Um, because some other members of the Subcommittee on the Homeless Commission have said they don't want an organized encampment. They want people to be able to camp wherever they want. And I'm going to just say here and now, for the record, I am not in favor of that. Clearly, we have people living all over. They have to do that because there is no place for them to go. And as long as that's true, I'm happy with the sidewalk ordinances that now stand. But I don't think the right answer is just to say, put down your tent or lay your body down wherever you can find a small patch of ground in a residential or a commercial zone. I think it's really incumbent on us to help people find a place that has a more stable existence. So that's why I presented this item and I'm looking forward to questions from the committee and the public. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation.
Um, so uh, I know we have a lot of people here who'd like to comment on this item. Uh, usually we go to comments from council members first. Um, so why don't we do some brief comments and then we'll go to public comment and then we'll have a more uh, a lengthier discussion about this. So do you have any preliminary comments? Sure, just a few quick things. Uh, first questions. of all, Councilman yeah. Rodriguez, and thank you for your work. Uh, it's funny, we talked about this on day one, back when we first came into this game. And uh, I guess the, the timber of acceptance hadn't reached the point yet, right? So I guess we're there now, uh, which is great. Because um, as, we, as, we, as we demonstrated, this can work. Um, and I'm glad you pointed out the, the, the issue with the Homeless Commission, because you know we have been looking for them for guidance on this as well. So uh, I'm glad you're taking the lead. Uh, I would like to just, uh, I guess, talk about maybe not talk, just consider um, either pathways integration or some sort of you know i'm really interested in people having um a leg up into back into the good life so whether that's services but conduct or whatever you know uh one of the community members here and i drafted something that could work for something like this as well but irrespective of that um i would definitely like to see some sort of rebuilding people element to this mm -hmm. site mm -hmm. So I uh, am also very happy that uh, Council Member Harrison and her amazing staff um, and her co-sponsors have brought this back to uh, the forefront. Uh, as Council Member Bartlett correctly stated, this is an idea that uh, he, myself, and Mayor Adegin pushed immediately when uh, we were first elected in 2016. Council Member Harrison joined us a few months later. Um, we had already been uh, very actively pushing staff to look <coughs> at things like this, and the amount of pushback uh, was just uh, insurmountable and um, very well organized. Uh, luckily, we have a much different understanding of the crisis now. We also have uh, the proven success of the stair center, which is one piece of what we had originally proposed. It was the piece that we were able to move forward, and staff has done an incredible job of implementing that. That is also something that was quite strongly resisted, and we were told it was impossible from the beginning. But uh, we pushed it through, and staff made it possible. And as we just learned at our last council meeting with an excellent presentation from Peter Radu and the um, HHCS staff, that it's our most successful homeless shelter type facility in the <coughs> city, and we're seeing amazing results. So I am absolutely delighted. Sometimes it takes a few passes for an idea to find its time. I do also want to register publicly my strong disappointment that our homeless commission that was given a very specific task to do chose not to do it. Uh, we could have been a lot further in this discussion, and I, I find it quite unusual that a referral from the city council to a commission <coughs> is not honored. So I just want to put it out there that I'm very frustrated by that. But I'm very pleased that now it's coming back to the city council, and I think it needs to stay with us mm -hmm. and with this committee, and we will get the work done of trying to figure out what additional facility we can put together, uh, not quite as uh, in structures, not quite as permanent or not quite as semi-permanent as the sleeping modules at the stair center, but certainly not as uh, desperate as what people are facing in the streets. So I'm looking forward to doing this. This is a, an overdue idea, and I really appreciate that you put it together in a way that we're gonna be able to land and move it forward. I do have just one clarification question for staff. I think it's, it's a nuance, but I think it's um, important to clarify. My understanding of the homeless count numbers around 1100 was that it includes people who are in transitional housing mm -hmm. and who are in shelters. 
So it's not that there's 800 on the streets and 300 in RVs. And no, of it, the 800, 300 of them are in RVs. Okay. 500 are in tents or lying on the pavement. Okay, great. That's I wanted to clarify that. And, the, and so the other 300, you just clarify where they are. Uh, the um, the sheltered portion of the counts are folks who are living in, so that's about um, roughly a quarter in Berkeley are living in uh, shelters and transitional housing. Okay. All right. Just want to make sure that was clear. Just yeah. a little confusing how it was presented. So I'm ready to go to comment. Can I see a show of hands on how many people here would like to comment on this item? Okay. So why don't we, I think we can do two minutes per person, but I'm going to ask you to stick to that because we do have quite a few people. So let's go ahead and start in the back with Ms. Ritchie, and we'll, I'll go through the back row, the middle row, the front row, and then um, folks who are up here uh, for Brenda. Yes, from friends of that line, this is music to my ear. I am thankful for this gesture because we have the here and there camp down in my neighborhood that Friends of Adeline has been babysitting and taking care of from its conception. And I'm hoping that this will work out, that we can find a place for those campers that is to serve their needs, trash pickup and whatever it needs for them to carry on in advance. That camp has been there, that's the cleanest camp in Northern California to be a tent camp. And I'm hoping that it will give people a uh, move to carry on as they have. And people have come in there and adjusted and moved on. But the people are there, not all the same people that started out. They have achieved and found resident and gone on, and we want to continue that. So thank you for this involvement and this plan. I applaud it. Thank you. Who's next in the back row? Who'd like to speak? Kelly? Thank you. Hiding under a hat. Stayed up too late reading. Um, I think this is a, a really important major. Uh, it's, uh, it should have happened sooner. We need to get moving on it right away. And if we think that we're going to get take care of all the homeless, I think we're being foolish. I mean, 200,000 people are what evacuated now. Um, California is burning. We are going to have more and more displaced people. It's going to make it harder for the homeless and the people of low income to find housing. They're going to get pushed out from by the people who are fleeing the fires, who are waiting to have their homes rebuilt, who are trying to find another place to live. So. We really, as we look at encampments, we need to be looking at expanding these sites and that um, at times like this, those are, those are gonna continue to grow depending on which areas are, are, are safe from fire or another kind of disaster. Uh, it's just, it's hard for me to, I'm so lucky when I went to sleep last night I felt how lucky I was to have a roof over my head and and that I didn't have to struggle on the street and be consumed with daily survival. Okay, hang on. Yeah. Uh, speaking as an individual, uh, I'm strongly in favor of the sanitation facilities, the porta potties, trash pickup, uh, tents. All of these things are really, really necessary. I have questions about an agency and an agency overseeing it. That's going to make some people reluctant to go into the outdoor shelter because they already are reluctant, That's some right. people, to participate in services. It's also going to suck up a lot of money and take money and up money that I'm thinking could otherwise be used for housing. And I always speak about permanent subsidies and I hate to see so much money go, go towards agencies and not subsidies. Uh, in terms of the homeless condition, the chart is was a challenge to deal with. And we're, we're constantly uh, addressing issues. We haven't uh, had an opportunity 
to address in depth the emergency outdoor shelter itself. I know that I have referred to the subcommittee that uh, the attorney from the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty wanted to have a continuing role in assisting with developing uh, models, and she is the same attorney who came out and spoke as well as presented to council with a letter supporting first they came for the homeless in terms of uh, an encampment being developed. Uh, there's another, there is a member of the subcommittee here, maybe they can speak to what the status of everything. I believe there are some concerns about, uh, about fitting within that chart model that was given uh, or, or the models that were presented and issues ideological differences, uh, but I can't speak to it. I, I have urged the subcommittee to come up with something. Thank you. Okay, anybody else in the back row want to comment on this item? Anyone anywhere in the back row? <laughs> no? Okay, so let's start with the front side and we'll move this way in the middle of that. Go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Betsy Morris. I'm from District 2. I'm extremely grateful that you're bringing this forward and I'm really, really happy to see that step. I wanted to bring um, the example and the lessons we've learned in the intentional communities co-housing movement and also from uh, places like Dignity Village, which is a 17 or 18 year old example of a exactly what we're talking about, except in the fine details. So the issue of, I would, our, I would like to see perhaps trying people in their own tents with their own belongings before enabling them to decide how, who, and at what cost, when would be these large portable tents that they would not own would be installed. So I recognize the desire to have quality and also control, but I want to say this to me is a community. It needs to be a community. I want to speak to what that means. And part of it is layout. Uh, barracks, armies, prisons line up uniform mm -hmm. uh, uh, uniform units in rows. And I would just like to give the opportunity for the residents to decide the best, uh, the best layout that provides both privacy and the ability to see each other. Uh, second, I didn't hear a, a mention, and I would like to invite a, strong, a, a budget part that's about community facilities. Maybe it's community tents for shared eating, socializing, and most important in my co-housing community, it's all of that. We have a space where we can all meet face to face in a circle. So these are like the soft details that I believe can help uh, a group cohere and support the mission and values that you're you're trying to create an end, but the, the means is as important as the material pieces. So I invite you to think about self enabling residents to have as much voice in, in uh, governance as is feasible and encouraging that in our RFP. Thank you. I just had a question. Is Dignity Village considered a permanent or semi permanent? At this community? point, they've been there 18 years. The lease keeps renewing, and I think so it's, city, it's intended it, as long term housing. Well, the city is leasing it and has no plans to date to move them out. So there is a chance. Uh, and I'm not up on this. There is a chance someday the city will take away the lease. But which city are we talking about? City of Portland. And there's other communities in Portland that are self governing But the Dignity Village is a very exceptional place. I brought their, they have a very wonderful website, Facebook page, and I brought their mission and values and also the terms of the contract. So the, the nonprofit is actually made up in large part by residents of the community, past, okay. present, plus allies. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So it becomes semi-permanent. Okay. But I'm not, not sure that's exactly what we have in mind, but I wanted to I understand, understand. Um, whether this location that you were referring to was a place where people were intended to come and go in three or six months and move on to a different housing situation, or whether it was considered more of a sort of tiny home or small, um, residence location where people 
generally were imagined to stay and settle into the community. Would you like me to answer? Nope. Sounds okay. like the latter. I'll and glad I look to forward share. to seeing the material it's, that you brought. If you have something, in. if you can bring it to us, it's you can hand it to the clerk. We'd appreciate seeing you. Okay. Who's next in the middle row? Anybody else? No? Okay. Mary. Thank you. Okay. So I actually do sit on that encampment subcommittee, and I have met several times with them. And I am not sure what happened to um, communication um, that from some of the um, conclusions we came to about that. Paul Kealoha Blake did mention at the last meeting that he com he communicated directly with you about that chart, Council Member Hahn, and did not receive any kind of a. Um, confirmation or acknowledgement about that so perhaps check your spam filter um, some of the things that we came up with um, for um, hard lines were that um, some of the rules that we couldn't be flexible on were about things like illicit drugs meth um, and um, heroin not being allowed but that there should be a path to rehab for the people that need it that there would be a zero tolerance policy for sexual assault and sexual harassment or trans assault, trans harassment, race, race baiting, any of that kind of thing. Um, also, um, that um, it was okay to have a definite location. Um, I don't have a problem with that and I'm not sure where that comes from because I haven't heard that from anyone, but I would definitely personally support that. Um, a few things that we also thought about were if there were a limited population that we could accommodate at one time, that we would start out with the populations that were people that were lower risk as far as community opposition. Um, seniors, people with disabilities, timed out foster kids, families with children, um, because that actually gives you a higher um, likelihood of success, which would allow you to expand other programs in an easier way. Um, another thing that we talked about was that um, there should be needle disposal. Um, needle disposal easily available, and perhaps you could talk to the Berkeley Free Clinic about getting the needle exchange program set up there. There are a lot of people that are diabetics, even if you don't have people that are using illicit drugs, and it's not always easy to find a way to get rid of needles, and that's something that really alarms the public. So that should be available as well. Um, and of course, we should plug it into pathways so that people can have the... the um, so that people can have the access to rehab because you can't just tell people they can't take drugs when they're when they're tweaking out and not give them some kind of a path to something else. So um, those were some of the primary considerations that we had recommended. Um, I do not run that subcommittee. I am not the person who writes up the reports and sends them out, and I'm still learning the process for how these things when their way through, but I hope that that helps clarify what we discussed. Also, um, we talked about um, what here there was Mary, doing with government. Mary, um, I'm sorry, the time is finished. Okay, but you know, I just wanted to clarify that because I didn't really like the characterization of our subcommittee or our, our commission. Thank you. This is before you came onto the committee, I should say. Yeah. yeah. So the referral has been out for 18 months. Well, we've been working on it, and we did come to those conclusions, and I am told that some of that was communicated to me, so check your email. Thank you. Uh, okay, is there anybody else who wants to speak on this in the front row? Or Okay, so I'm going to start on this side. Anybody else? Um, did you want to speak? Maybe? Did you have your hand up? I did. Okay, so let's start with you, and then we'll keep going. Okay. Um, so I want to reiterate what Becky Morris said. She said a lot of what I wanted to say, and um, uh, both and. So this is this is a good endeavor. But did you say only seventy five tents? Because we have a much greater need. So we also need to uh, instruct the police to stop harassing people who have no other option. They have a right to exist and. They have to live somewhere, so they need services too. They need porta potties and they need trash pickup, 
porta potties with hand washing stations um, in the meantime until we have enough housing offered. And then I would also like to encourage consideration of tiny houses that may be less yes. toxic and uh, more durable so they don't end up in landfill because how long will these tents last and are they going to be off gassing? Um, I'm not saying don't don't use them because we have an emergency housing situation, but also longer term tiny housing. I'd like to know, I didn't follow Ben, what happened with your um, stackable units plan that sounded like it had a great um, financial plan behind it too. It's in motion. Oh, good. Yeah, the first okay. meeting. It's so on. there's there's that too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please. Hi, so I'm Andrea Henson and I've been working with the Where Do We Go campaign. I really thank Kate for introducing this on October 15th. In fact, I'm very disappointed that no one in the city, except for Kate and Cheryl, but no one has come out to the encampment. I've been in 99% of the tents at Seabreeze and um, I-80 as well as Shell Mound Ashby. And I took uh, 40 copies of this proposal and I talked to the residents and got their ideas. However, many people have not spoken to them and there are some things that are very positive that they do want that folks who haven't spoken to them have advocated against. Um, I don't like the idea of good homeless versus bad homeless. I appreciate the fight of here there and I appreciate the fight of, of uh, first they came for the homeless, but we are all not cookie cutter. That's what I've learned. And sometimes always holding them out or as you should be more like here there or you should not use drugs. No one has come in and seen how, how you survive on the street in the actual community. Um, also, yesterday we had major wins. No one came out. It's five days before the first. Nobody has any money. But nobody in the city is thinking about that because no one goes out and talks to the folks in the encampments. They can't buy ropes. There's a lot of really pressing immediate needs. Um, also, I want to talk about, I think that the encampment is good. That'll be for the most vulnerable. However, as mentioned, it can only provide for 75 people. We're doing a GoFundMe for 15 thousand dollars right now we have approximately a little over two thousand everyone is going to get a brand new tent to get ready for the winter i don't care if you shoot up i don't care if you're gay i don't care if you're black white yellow blue yes, i don't yes. care if you're fat or skinny it really doesn't matter you're going to get a new tent why is that important because what if you're in an abusive relationship on the street and you're in a compromising position and somewhat you have to go ask for that you can't get out there are many ways that people survive and we shouldn't create a uh, good bad homeless uh, lastly so watch what we do with that 15,000 I might only get three and I'll still have a fully inhabitable safe place to be and lastly the rats right now there are pancake rats all over the place I live at the encampment that's where my second home is and I call it home because they love me and I love them and when I go out because the city hasn't picked up the trash the rats are crawling all over my tent at night <laughs> That's how bad it is. And we're begging for over a month to pick up the trash and the rats are crawling all over us. Thank you. Well, thank you for sharing that and hopefully some people will be able to, to come and speak to us here as well. But I understand going out is also important, so thank you. Like everybody, I appreciate that this is in front of you now and that this proposal is before the city. I'm also worried, disturbed, anxious because of the amount of time that these things take and the sense that I have being out there with Andrea that we are in a crisis, an emergency, that that emergency is going to happen. Not in the timetable that this committee is thinking of. The people that we're talking about are people who are being regularly evicted by Caltrans every day. They're refusing to go. There's going to be a crisis there the next time Caltrans comes. And what we are proposing is that the city needs to have a place for people to be before they're evicted from the Caltrans property. Otherwise, they will be scattered, they will be arrested, and we'll have you know, a kind of train wreck which needs to be avoided. This needs to happen quickly. It also needs to happen with the communication with the people who are there. Right. They, you need to understand what they want, what they have done. There's a level of organization that's happened there that you need to be able to build on. 
the fact that they have gotten tents, that they can get tents, that they can organize themselves, that has to be something that has to be built in. Imposing rules on them is a way to create something that doesn't work. You impose rules rather than talk with them before you impose a rule. See what their rules are. See what is working there. They have a community there. <coughs> the here there created their own rule. In Modesto, the move towards this encampment started when the people themselves, after they read the Boise, the Martin B. Boise decision, went and took over a park. That's right. You have to use the initiative and the strength of the parent community that's there if you want to have it succeed. Otherwise, you'll again create something so narrow and restricted that many people simply won't go in. My, 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 my. I'm glad that this is finally a real discussion that I hear this list from Council Member Harrison. It's pretty obvious. She's been talking with some real homeless people. The next thing I want to say is I'm disappointed in the public. I should say uh, the lack of recognition of Clark Sullivan is here, who was one of the founding members to hear their encampment. Myself, who was also there current residents who maintain that. I want public recognition for that. All the rules that you listed didn't happen just magically. I was evicted 17 times and lost $8,000 worth of property in the city of Baca. Now we have a situation now with the, where, where do we go in Canada? which stretches for a half a mile. We're not talking a couple of blocks. Logistically, to evict this entire area is a nightmare. You're talking a minimum of 500000 guaranteed. What we're asking for is while you're having this discussion, in fact, I don't really agree with your number 75 here. There's, I know there's 200 people where I'm at because I'm embedded down there. Right now, Today, this morning, I see one, two, three council people that can get on the phone and ask Caltrans and call up Caltrans and say, we're having this meeting this week. Let's do a 30-day moratorium. Wait till they're listening. Don't, he gets more time. Because you guys- I'm sorry, you don't run the meeting. You stopped listening to him. I Give him more time. That is really rude. What we're asking, what we're asking, what we're asking for, what I'm asking for, is that there's a Caltrans meeting with, with the city this week. You have a proposal right now before this committee that you want to work on. Let's take some time out, get, provide us some stability so that residents from where we, from this encampment can plug in and get their opinion about what you're proposing. Let's do 30 days. In that 30 days, if there's anything that happens that directly threatens public health or public safety, deals off the table. But in the meantime, no matter what you decide today, I want the trash picked up. Yeah. Thank you very much. I want the trash picked up. I have to live there. She lives there. There's 200 people down there picking up the trash 5, 5, 30, 6, 30 in the morning, putting it in bags. And we have Caltrans ignoring piles six foot high. I want the trash picked up. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else who'd like to comment, sir? Yes, I'd like to comment. My name is Clark Sullivan. Um, I've been an activist for 50 years. I've worked with homeless people for the last 30, been homeless myself, I'm home, currently homeless at the Here and There camp. Um, I have absolutely no faith in this commission of anything the city does to help homeless people. Um, basically the same solution keeps applied again and again, and basically it looks to me like a concentration camp. Um, unless we get to make the rules and decide how we're going to administrate something 
Um, I see it being a total failure, a bureaucratic nightmare. Um, I think $500,000 is a waste of money because any monies that are spent that do not provide permanent affordable housing for people are a waste of money. And basically all the money ends up going to poverty pimps to do studies after study after study of homeless people. So I have very little faith. I'm looking up here at this board. It says create affordable housing and housing support services for our most vulnerable community members. And that hasn't really happened here at all, has it? So um, uh, don't expect me to participate in this, in this, your program. Um, and I'm going to advise people in our camp not to participate in it because it's just another concentration camp. You know, and I don't care. You can be liberal or whatever the city wants, whatever kind of politics they're back in this week. But basically, it's hurting all the homeless people together in one big yard, just like you would hurt political prisoners. So um, that's my feeling, and thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to come? Okay. Before we go back to responses and discussion and staff, I'm going to call a two-minute break. Okay. Okay, when I sit down in the room, you don't have a form. Yep. So you have a two-minute break. Stretch your legs. <laughs> I'm going to stretch mine. Anyway, there you go, folks. So I'm going to let you go.